Welcome to the Teach, Learn, Live podcast. I'm your host, Tim Bullard, Secretary of the Department of Education in Tasmania. Through this podcast, we're going to shed some light on how we're connecting students and young people to succeed. Every day in our classrooms, we've got teachers working hard to inspire our learners. And I see great school leaders making a real difference in many people's lives. Join me as we get to know more great teachers, curious learners and inspiring families and communities who teach, learn and live in Tasmania. Teach, learn, live Tasmania! (laughs) Today's guest is Jeremy Rockcliffe, Minister for Education and Training and Deputy Premier for the State of Tasmania. Jeremy is a northwest Tasmanian who grew up on the family farm in Sassafras. And apart from farming and rural life, Jeremy has a strong empathy with public and community services and has worked with a number of organisations, including Lifeline Northwest, Natural Resource Management, Land Care Groups, and Youth and Family Focus. Jeremy campaigned successfully in 2002 to become an MP for Braddon in the House of Assembly and up to 2014 had held a number of shadow portfolios. In 2014, under the newly elected Liberal government, Jeremy was appointed as Deputy Premier, Minister for Education and Training, Minister for Primary Industries and Water, and Minister for Racing. And since then, he has held a number of portfolio areas, most recently as Minister for Mental Health and Wellbeing, Disability Services and Community Development, Trade and Minister for Advanced Manufacturing and Defence Industries. Quite a portfolio. Welcome, Jeremy. Thank you, Tim. It's great to be here. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the ins and outs of the role of a politician, can you tell me a little bit about your job in the Tasmanian Government? Well, I can. And if I just start with the very basics, really. Firstly, I'm the North West Coast, so I represent Braddon and Braddon really is pretty much from where I am now, Sassafras, Port Sorrell, the entire West Coast, Smithton and including King Island. So it's quite a big electorate, a uh, very diverse electorate. And the first thing I've got to be mindful of and uh, we work hard at is just representing our constituents. So we're a shoulder to cry on, uh, we help people with uh, some applications for whatever that might be and uh, a lot of housing issues and things like that, a lot of things. So that base job is so very, very important. So I must never forget that because I would never be Deputy Premier or Minister of Education without firstly being elected. So that's the main, my main game in, in that sense. But in government, it is a whole lot more complex than I had 12 years in opposition as a local MP. And uh, being in government, you are very, very busy, a lot of meetings, a lot of time, but you can do some really good stuff. And it's really where you can make the biggest difference. And I think most importantly, really think about what you want to achieve, because it's such a privilege to be be a minister or any portfolio and being able to think, how can I make the biggest difference? Because it might not last that long. So you do as much as you can whenever you can do it. And it's really busy, but it's great. And you meet so many people. And I've seen every corner of Tasmania in my role. So obviously you're involved in a lot of community-based organisations in your younger days, but you made a decision fairly early to enter into politics. What sort of motivated you to take that course Well, when you said um, I was elected in 2002 in the intro, I thought, yeah, it has been a long time. And when those first few years in Parliament seemed to go quite slowly because it was really really challenging to get your head around from being a farmer to a a local member of Parliament. And so it's gone very quickly. So I was 32 when I was elected. So I've always been interested in, in politics, not necessarily for one particular side or the other. I remember as a a young person um, just interested in the machinations of politics. I used to read a lot of editorials and opinion pieces and keep an eye on what was going on politically, mainly around us in Australia and Tasmania um, and further afield. So politics has always fascinated me. I remember um, my parents weren't necessarily, they didn't push me into politics at all. My dad was a local government councillor, did a lot of community stuff. I used to go building, I remember my father was an Apexian, and uh, the good old days, and Apex was a great organisation. Up to 40 at that t- stage, you had to, you know, young young men, really, then. And I remember going building bus shelters uh, with Dad for the local area. And 
I guess that community ethic that uh, was role modelled as a family sort of played a factor in me putting my hand up for some of these community organisations. And I got involved in uh, my side of politics uh, at around 19 or 20, which was an interesting experience. But I realised that if I ever wanted to harbour some political ambition, um, and I never really thought as a young person I'd actually have the courage to do so, to be honest. I thought, oh, I like politics and I like playing a role, but could I really put my hand up? Because that's a big challenge. But I realised if I wanted to one day, you just can't sit back and be a member of a party. You've got to actually get out there and learn more about your community. And so I was directed towards some of the things I'm passionate about at that time, and Lifeline was one of those passions. Now, I've been through a long list of portfolios that you either hold or have held, but the constant since you've been in government has been education and training mm -hmm. as well as the portfolio of Deputy Premier. What's your passion for public education? Why are you constantly drawn toward that portfolio? Well, thinking back, it may well have been the influence of my grandmother, who was a passionate educator. I certainly would have never supported my side of politics, I hasten to add. And occasionally I ran into people at Hobart that was taught by my grandmother. And that may have been an influence. And that her influence, I think, would have instilled the influence of my father that believed in education, as did my mother, that you've got to get a good education, do, do what you can, and work hard at school, and all those sorts of things. And so that was probably instilled into me. And I guess developed a passion for education probably since I've entered Parliament and I've witnessed what it can do and how it can transform lives and you come into contact with people that are products of the public education system and how it supported them and the light bulb moment goes on really and you realise that, you know, it can actually make a huge difference. Um, it wasn't just my parents telling me this. You see people and how their lives have been transformed positively through public education and you can also see that some people are born in very challenging circumstances and I think the best way to support people, irrespective of their, their challenging backgrounds or circumstances, is through that education environment and public education provides that vehicle. So you and I are both really fortunate because we have basically unlimited access to schools right across the state and I know that you spend a lot of time visiting schools and classrooms and talking to principals and teachers. What really inspires you when you walk into one of our schools? Well, the leadership of the school is always so very important. And I love speaking to principals, firstly, because they normally greet me at the, the front gate. And you can just see the spark in their eyes and they're just so enthusiastic and proud of their environment and their school and I think the responsibility they also feel is that it's not just about perimeters around the school gates that they have a whole of community responsibility and they're so very proud of their kids and their students and supportive of their staff as well and that can that's conveyed into the their assistants and uh, the teachers and the teacher assistants and everyone that makes up the school and you know we're talking um, right now during the whole COVID-19 times, Tim, and the level of appreciation that you and I see when we visit a school, I think has been very much extended throughout the whole of Tasmania as uh, people have been educated in different learning environments and including at home. And I think our respect for our school leaders, our teachers and everyone who makes up the school is just almost tenfold as what it was perhaps beginning of this year. So you've spoken around that responsibility for outside the school gate, not just the perimeter, and certainly that's something that I'm seeing more and more. I'm really interested around your push on wellbeing that's happened through education and also with you holding the portfolio of Minister for Mental Health and Wellbeing. Why have you put such an emphasis on child and student wellbeing? Because it conveys, uh, well, it's... It combines, sorry, two of my passions really, and that's education, that's mental health. And you ask me a question about why did I go into politics, I'm not sure I'll really answer that in that rather long garbled answer. But essentially with my farming background, if I go back a bit, 
people might think, oh, well, I went into politics because of farming and farmers getting a better deal on regional communities. And that's largely right. I was a young farmer. I thought we should be rewarded more for what we did, you know, daylight to dark and more. And we weren't. But it was when I joined Lifeline and became a Lifeline telephone counsellor that I realised there was a whole world out there that wasn't so black and white. And as a young, single farmer uh, with limited life experience, the world can be very black and white. And it's not until you're on the phones at two o'clock in the morning speaking to someone that's in the process of ending their own life that you realise, and the reasons that they are conveying for that, um, that you realise that uh, the world is not black and white, a lot of grey areas. And that experience really reinforced a lot of values that I had. And the world is made up of very eclectic bunch of people and um, tolerance and acceptance was what I learned. Acceptance is a better word than tolerance is what I learned from that experience. And so that was my, and I realised that mental health was back then a big issue and the stigma around mental health and wellbeing wasn't well known or talked about as much as it should, uh, particularly in young men. And uh, a lot more needed to be done and I witnessed some of my close acquaintances and friends in very depths of despair as we all go through certain times of our lives and I think those experiences I thought to myself well uh, well-being is important and the world is a lot more complex for kids these days than it was when I was growing up there's a lot more things to think about do watch absorb and you can't always turn it off either uh, it's there in your face for these young kids and that impacts on their well-being and their mental health and whatever I can do to wear both hats in the mental health and well-being space and education space, I will do. And I'm just so amazed about what's happening in the Department of Education and the leadership that's been demonstrated within the department in this area as well and giving our kids a voice. No one would have asked me at all at school probably how I was feeling or when I thought about things in terms of my own reflections, but to give our kids a voice through the survey and other things that we've been doing, I think is just amazing and important and a great um, opportunity for our schools and our teachers to learn from our kids and support them all better. And I suppose it was interesting, wasn't it, during COVID, how we had the wellbeing checking tool running, allowing teachers real-time information around how students who were at home were feeling. That was a real shift for us, but under that too was what we could do about that when we were learning at home. And uh, I suppose one of the other themes that's really come through is that idea of the department moving much more into the space of partnerships. So as we move into wellbeing, as we move into learning off-site, that idea of partnerships has also become a key theme under your, your government. What can you see in terms of the way that education is sort of growing into that space of being a partner rather than a sole provider? Well, I was always very conscious um, when I took over the responsibility in 2014. There was a lot of discussion about how do we engage the whole of the community in the education space. And, you know, schools are often blamed for things that happen outside their remit, if you do. You know, and I thought, well, hold on, we all need to take responsibility for this and all of us need to be more involved in our schools and our parents' engagement also if we can create an environment where we're just not seeing our schools as a place where we drop off kids at 8.30 in the morning and pick them up at 3 and how do we involve our parents, our carers, our families and our community more in our schools so they are truly a part of the community, as we often, often say. So... One of the things that you've done is to set up the Workforce Roundtable, recognising, I think, in that partnership spirit that it is a whole of community issue to raise the quality of teaching. Why did you think that was a good idea and that the time was right to do that now? Because I learnt a lot through the experience of the Reviewing the Education Act and that's four years of age now. That hadn't been renewed since about 1994. And that was a really interesting experience for me because it forced or encouraged us, me, I guess the department, to go out there and consult with the community on what they want for the next 20 years for their Education Act. And the principles that applied and objectives of that act became almost a bit of a focus in many respects. And I've mentioned it here earlier around the fact that 
irrespective of your circumstance or background, everyone has that fundamental right to a quality education. And that quality education is the public education. Everyone um, should have access to that. And your earlier question leads to this as well. It also taught me about the fact that there are a lot of barriers to people's participation in education. It might be their circumstance, their home environment, uh, a disability, trauma. And I suddenly realised that there's all these barriers to provide that education that we need to get rid of as much as possible. And the wellbeing space, the mental health and wellbeing space, can be a barrier. And how do we support our kids to work through these times and um, their personal experiences to engage them better in the education? And so that experience of the 2016 Act reinforced that to me, but also that spirit of cooperation. There's a lot of input into that. Uh, we had feedback from various stakeholders that loved or loathed some of the areas that we were actually trying to change in that act. And that taught me the value of making sure that every single person who has a stake in something so important as education needs to come to the table and have a say. And so the round table where we had such a huge diverse group and we don't always have the Australian Education Union around the same table um, or hadn't probably previously, but having them and the university and um, Tim, the Department of Education and Teacher Registration Board and parents, I'm sorry, principals, it was a great collective, if you like, and spirit of collaboration and saying, you know what, we've got our new act, we've got our teachers coming on board, how do we make the most of this and get the best possible quality out of, but out of listening to everyone? So I'm really interested, um, we've talked about wellbeing, we've talked about teacher quality in the, in the Workforce Roundtable. What do you think's next um, in education? You're basically, you know, a bit over halfway through this term of government. What's next for you in terms of continuing to improve education in Tasmania? Well, we've got to make sure that what we've committed to that we can deliver and that what's been important as well in the last 12 months, and you've been through it too, Tim, and again, the student voice was part of this, and that is the, what is the Alice Springs Declaration, which we went through, and so that set some goals nationally for education, and through that, we really raised a flag and the importance around equity around education and that provision of equity, um, picking up on some of the things that I spoke about in terms of the objection the objectives of the Act, you know, getting rid of all those barriers to education that may well be inhibiting a person to engage uh, effectively in education, ensuring that education has that resource available to support kids to learn is important to me. That includes our commitments we've made in education, of course, and seeing those through. The infrastructure development as well, um, you know, it's... Uh, important that our kids do have those that modern learning environment and we've got a plan for that so i want to stay that course but the next thing is just really thinking outside the square i suppose we've had a greater sense of i think collaboration across all stakeholders in education in the last few months and i think covid 19's brought everyone together on the one page there'll be agreements and disagreements on certain direction no doubt but we can do it if we need to do it. So what's the last couple of months taught me is that when the chips are down, people do rally around and forget all the who's wearing what hat and any past prejudice we might have. Uh, so I would like to see a greater spirit of collaboration build upon that in terms of a way forward for where we take education next. And we had a 150-year celebration of public education just uh, last year where we did celebrate the wonders of public education and we need to build upon that now. So I guess, um, if nothing else, the last couple of months and indeed building upon the last few years is I've learned more and more about education and become more and more passionate about it because, as I said, I can see the, the true benefits from it. And it's about maintaining that principle of equity throughout, uh, but it's also utilising that spirit of collaboration that's being developed and those relationships that have been strengthened to really think, look, what is possible? We just shouldn't be putting our preconceived ideas in little boxes. We need to open all those boxes up and put them on the table. Um, equity is the core principle, but a lot of things we've done 
Tim, that probably not many people really know too much about outside of our school world and our world that we, you and I work in. The 9 to 12 review was a very good exercise and that's been a cross-sectoral collaboration. So I'm very interested in seeing what we can do in terms of the senior secondary area as well and how we can, we often talk about a, a job-ready generation, which is kind of like a government kind of line, I know, but how do we really prepare our kids for the next thing, the world? And the world's changed a bit the last couple of months. So how can education be really adaptable, flexible to support really quite massive changes? I'm interested in ensuring we can really do, I think, build on the vocational education and training space as well in the senior secondary area. I think we can do more there. And I'm conscious of the fact that the conversation that I've been having around the 11 and 12 space hasn't always been about years 11 and 12 and then university. There are so many other options and pathways a young person can uh, explore and, and look at. And vocational education and training is, is part of that very much. A number of times as we've been talking, you've referred to where we are now and what you've seen in the past few months, and you've obviously mentioned COVID. And I think for the purposes of listeners, it's worth saying we're still in the midst of, of COVID and things are looking positive. But what have been your reflections around what you've seen in our parents, our teachers and leaders and our school communities in terms of how they've shown strength and resilience over the last couple of months? Well, I think those values of the Department of Education really have come to the fore. And if we think about those values in terms of the values that we are instilling in our students, that resilience, as an example. But in actual fact, um, I've seen all those values reflected in the leadership of our, well, our department, our schools, our teachers, whose worlds have been turned upside down. One week they're teaching in the classroom, the next week they've got three kids in the classroom and trying to work out how they're going to engage their kids online um, or not, as the case may be. And so how people have adapted to that and enormously quickly, out of necessity really, has been amazing. Our principals have led, I think, with really great courage because there are very, it's common to feel very anxious and uncertain in these times that naturally been reflected in some of our our staff across our schools as well. All of us, none of us knew what COVID-19 was going to present. Uh, we were talking about closing schools for almost the whole year a couple of months ago when we weren't really certain if we could flatten the curve and all those sorts of things. So I've been really, I haven't been amazed because I knew that it was always there, but it's been tremendous to see that all those values and all the, the leadership skills of our, our principals and others have come to the fore during this, which I think has been fantastic to see. So I've learned that we can be adaptable, I suppose, in that mm. sense. It's taught us the fact, you know what, we can actually think outside the square. You know, this is not too much of a, well, this has been a big challenge, but if something's presented to you, our natural instincts to think, oh, well, I just don't think that could happen. But in actual fact, it actually probably can. Um, and it's a matter of how we how we go about that. And I think the very collaborative way that uh, the department and our schools have worked with our communities has probably demonstrated that is the way. I think should be forced on people. It's about having a conversation. This has been a conversation out of necessity, the COVID-19 circumstance, but we've got through it. And our parents, as I said before, I think of, and carers have got a, a communities have got a greater appreciation of our teachers. And you can often tell in the meme, memes that pop up, the cartoons reflecting parents' Challenges. challenges at home and those subtle messages are there saying, you know, what our teachers do a fantastic job. What I've heard today is some really great reflections about the need to continue to build equity and engagement through public education, but also I'm hearing from you that the time's absolutely right to be looking at different ways of doing business. I have to say it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you today in such an informal way, uh, Minister, and I just want to really thank you for your time. Well, thank you, Tim, and thanks for the leadership of the department as well under you. It's been a very challenging time, uh, but these times have taught us, I guess, the importance of our, our public education provider. And I get a sense that uh, through all this, when we talk about engagement, and we, we, these are just reflected in the attendance Back in kindergarten to grade six, people saying, you know what, our schools are great. Our kids are there not just 
not just to read and write, but their whole sense of well-being and communication with their friends. And our parents, I get a sense, are going to engage with their school communities a lot more as well, which I think is a positive. There's always got to be a silver lining to what has been devastating for many, many Tasmanian citizens in terms of their personal circumstances. But in this sense, I think um, public education is and is seen to be stronger as a result of what we've just experienced and experiencing still, I recognise. But thank you. It's been great to have a chat. Thank you. I hope that you've enjoyed today's podcast. To hear more about those people who teach, learn and live in Tasmania, join us at www.education.tas.gov.au forward slash podcast or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Why not subscribe so that you can keep up to date with what we're doing? Or if you have a story about an inspiring teacher or student, email us at teachlearnlive at education.tas.gov.au.